Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. I'm Richard Fields. On the program today, we have Jason McPhee, an engineer for the state of California, and uh, Philip Larea, who is a financial advisor and a poet, and uh, the, uh, the writer of Minute Dot Online. Uh, Obamacare has been declared unconstitutional. Finally, a circuit judge in Texas said what has been obvious all along is that, to me anyway, is that Congress has no business running a health care scheme of any kind. But he did it on the basis that uh, the tax has disappeared. Therefore, the John Roberts excuse for making Obamacare and the individual mandate uh, uh, constitutional has somehow, has finally disappeared. Uh, you know, the, the odd thing about it is, uh, you know, if you go back to the history of it, is that the Solicitor General had argued to the Supreme Court that it was in no wise a tax, that it was a fine. Uh, and uh, the Supreme Court ruled that, therefore, as a fine, it was unconstitutional. But John Roberts said, well, you know what, you've gone to a lot of trouble, let me rewrite the law for you. So the Supreme Court wrote Obamacare and never had to go back to the Congress to be passed. So something that was unconstitutional was deemed constitutional because it was a tax, not a fine. So Robert says, hey, the Congress has authority to tax, and this is not a fine, it's a tax, so they can do it. Well, now this Texas judge has come out and said, well, hang on, if it's a tax, and now there is no tax, the law itself is unconstitutional. Uh, people have looked at it, including uh, libertarian thinkers, and said, you know, this is the most ridiculous uh, reasoning ever. And really, I think the Texas judge is just saying, you know, just throwing a monkey wrench in the thing, but the, uh, I guess- Well, no, the reasoning is sound. The, 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 uh, the legal argument against it is on severability. They're saying that he might be able to throw out, you know, certain narrow portions of the Obamacare, but you can't throw the whole thing out. But I don't think there's a severability clause in the Obamacare that, legislation. There, there's not a soul that thinks that um, if it got to the Supreme Court, that it would even be considered. Uh, because the argument, there is nothing that says that a law has to be funded uh, or that it has to be funded a certain way. There's no, uh, if we, for instance, say that there is going to be a tax to pay well, for gets, roads. Yeah, but that gets back to the original excuse for writing Obamacare. That's what I'm saying. It was unconstitutional to begin which, with. Which was that yeah. you can't force somebody to buy something. But you under can tax the, Under the inter Interstate Commerce. But you can tax them. Interstate Commerce Clause says, uh, it has been interpreted, I don't agree with the interpretation, but it's been widely interpreted to say that we can regulate con uh, commerce. But if you are not buying health insurance, you are not engaging in commerce. And Obamacare said, you will engage in exactly. commerce. That's not regulating commerce, that's forcing commerce. Exactly. Two different things. And mm -hmm. the, the tax angle, the, the Roberts tax excuse was to say, well, we'll forget about this, you know, this forcing commerce thing because that's a clearly unconstitutional. We'll, we'll call it a tax, therefore it's okay. Now there's no tax, right? So it's not so the whole thing is not okay once again. Well, again, it whether is whether or not the uh, appellate court, uh, the sixth or the fifth or whatever it is in Texas, whether or not they will agree is probably a, a chance of slim to none. But if they agree, it will get to the Supreme Court. Well, and the interesting, I, I guess, because of what I do is, um, uh, as I said, most of the most of the thinking on it was, you know, this is not a serious thing. Uh, but I will say that uh, healthcare stocks, you know, it's no secret that we've been, you know, we're, if we're not officially in a bear market, we're certainly in a bear market. Um, and the place where people hide when you go into a bear market are healthcare stocks because they're slow growth, reliable, people take their drugs in good and bad times. And yet, because of that ruling, uh, because of that Texas ruling, at the same time all the growth stuff was getting just destroyed, and you would expect that money to go into health care? It didn't. Health care got destroyed. So somebody took it seriously. Well, yeah. I mean, the, the, the legal arguments, I think, are, are pretty clear. Now, the interesting thing going forward is whether or not people will take a really close look. This is, I'm talking about people now. Back when Hillary Care was being considered, the uh, percentage of the gross national product that composed of health care was, I think, something like, I forget what it was, maybe... Uh, you might remember seven uh, or eight percent. Going or, back into the early nineties, yeah, but it was, it was like significantly lower. I forget the exact percentage. Uh, low teens. Low teens. It's now high teens. Uh, or double, over. Uh, so now uh, over twenty percent. Over twenty percent. 
it has increased uh, exponentially. It's the, the cost largest, of healthcare. It's the largest industry in the U.S. Bar the cost now. of healthcare has increased exponentially as a result of Obamacare, or as a, or in, certainly in correlation with Obamacare. Now you can argue that there, you know, there are more uh, uh, bells and whistles in healthcare now. There are more drugs, more uh, life-saving techniques, and so forth. And that's part of it. But most of it is that when you've got a guaranteed payer, people are going to use more, whether they need it or not. Sure. And that's what's been behind, in many respects, the uh, opioid crisis and uh, you know the staggering amount of unused prescriptions that people just pick up. Uh, but what has happened is that uh, you know it's invisible. Anytime you anytime the government subsidizes anything, the uh, the price is to subsidize it up, not down. Yeah. And so what has happened is you now have a four trillion dollar industry, which, to put that in perspective, is the vast majority of which is elective. Uh, this is not the life-saving intensive care stuff. This is the most of it. I don't uh, know what the percentage is, but a huge percentage is the last year. Is the last is, year of life. It's a staggering number. Last year of life. Uh, but so most much money, of it is is, is um, you know uh, the last year of life, and even those last years of life. Uh, you know, my mother, bless her heart, uh, was on 27 prescriptions when, yeah. when she died. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, uh, so uh, what we have are doctors who say, hey, you know, if you're having a side effect from this, then let's give you this for that. And then it, I mean, it just keeps going and going. And so uh, the pharmaceutical industry is the single largest part of uh, the total cost of healthcare. But to put that in perspective, well, that's a big part. Of the, another big part is the fact that the states, at the state level, we've uh, in 35 states, we have made it impossible to start a new hospital, a competitive hospital, by right. restrictive licensing laws. If you uh, have, if you want to build a new hospital, you got to get licensed by the state. Guess who runs the state licensing boards? Right. The existing hospital, right. uh, and they they're going to say, well, I don't think we need any more competition. Sure. Well, and it's right down the line. Doctors won't let nurses uh, expand the scope of their practice. And they'll shut down uh, medical schools because, yeah. well, they're not quite good enough. When what? in the end, all of this is essentially saying that this is a, a market that's not being allowed to function. I mean, it's, yeah, uh, yeah. the government has constantly distorted it in one way or another. Price signals are not getting through, and that's what's leading to a lot of the prices going up. And, uh, you know, anything that maybe gives us a chance to, to not allow for even a you know, less price signals to get through, which is, you know, more and more government control. It, hopefully it's a good thing if we can, you know, but, you know, I, I fear, though, that the consequences of this may be to just throw more uncertainty to the public and then a backlash against, you know, Republicans on this, which, you know, uh, you know may push for us farther towards single payer in the end. So I, I hope not, but that's uh, that's kind of one of my fears about well, all this. Well, we'll all have health care, but we yeah. won't be able to. <laughs> we're, our, our taxes will be so high, we don't have a place to live. We'll all have which, a place which, in which, line. <laughs> which, causes, which causes a homeless problem. And I understand that the homeless problem has now invaded Sesame Street. Yes, apparently they have a, a new character that they're introducing, uh, and it's uh, we're not talking about Oscar the Grouch. Uh, we're Who lives in a trash can, right? Yes, for 50 years he's been living in a trash can, and, and um, you know that really hasn't concerned anybody up to this point, <laughs> and the fact that he's green <laughs> too. But uh, but anyways, they've they've decided to introduce a new character, um, and I guess that's to you know make kids a little more aware of the the homelessness situation and to be some more sensitive to it. But you know, one of the things that you know just has to um, it, it just it keeps gnawing at me is that this is just more evidence of uh, I think for those of you who might have seen Stossel's show on boiling the frog, you know, the idea that we we just keep slipping into these uh, conditioning of, of maybe some of these problems from the uh, socialist state, I guess, you know, of of, of more and more things happening like this where we get people who are, you know, homeless, people who can't afford to live anywhere. And we, it, it happens so gradually that we just don't even notice it as it's happening, you know, to the point where, you know, um, it becomes normal to see a homeless <coughs> character on Sesame Street, you know, and, and that's, that's a, a normal thing. We're not looking at this as, as just something to, 
educate kids about the letters and numbers now it's they're sort of a just a normalized character on Sesame Street that's homeless which is and is you know I um, there's no question that there are you know the major issues of mental illness and, and things like that about homelessness but uh, you know uh, we where I live in a nice area Folsom uh, the homeless problem is you know is significant and I talk to them a lot and I always have and here's something that I find, is that there is at least some segment of that that's significant, that people choose to be homeless because they choose to be individuals. When you think about what it means to own a home, the home owns you. And when you think about all the ways that you have to deal with, interface with government because you own a home, there are a whole lot of people, and that stretches into your utilities and all kinds of, I mean, it is just what you do now. And so there are a great many people who said, you know, I'm more or less a cowboy. I want to be able to get on my horse and ride. And, you know, I don't mind sleeping in the saddle. I mean, 100 years ago or 150 years ago, people didn't say that cowboys were homeless. Um, we no longer allow, uh, we have rules against borders. Uh, my grandmother ran a boarding house on 19th and 8th Street which would now be by far and away illegal. And these were tended to be transient people who would pay her, you know, whatever the going rate was. I think it was like 50 bucks a month. They'd come and they go and come and go. And so what we've done is we have basically criminalized the idea of homelessness or the idea of individuality. Somebody who says, this is not, I do not wish to live the American dream. It's not my dream. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, it goes to zoning laws. Exactly. A lot of places have single-family zoning, although Portland and Minneapolis, a few other places are saying, well, we're not going to have, uh, you know, required single-family zoning anymore. I mean, if you want to build a single-family home on, a, on, a, on your lot, you can, but we're not going to make it only single-family zoning, which, you know, allows for infill, allows for more uh, inexpensive housing to be built. That's the good side. The bad side is tiny homes, forget about it. You can't build a tiny home. Uh, mobile homes, find out, you know, push to the outside, you know, the roughest parts of the neighborhood, you, you know, it's very, very difficult to find siting for a mobile home. Any kind of uh, housing that is inexpensive is very difficult to get permitted unless you want to do, unless it's, uh, unless it's uh, what do you call it, the inclusive, inclusive, unless they're, unless they're soaking the development to build something that's, uh, that's, that's subsidized for the buyer. Section 8 or yeah. what have you, yeah. yeah. Uh, so the, the, whole, the whole idea, you know, it, it's regulation. Uh, largely regulation uh, that is it's it's NIMBY regulation. Don't mm -hmm. don't have any rough small houses in my neighborhood because I don't want any uh, you know cabin next to my McMansion. That's the sort of thing that is making it very very difficult for builders and developers to meet the demand for inexpensive housing. Sure. And you know, there were, uh, you know, there was a great story actually yesterday in uh, uh, San Francisco. A uh, guy had bought a home, a 900 square foot home in the heart of San Francisco and paid, you know, uh, over a million dollars for it. First thing he did was uh, tear it down. He was going to put up a 3,000 square foot home on the property. Well, the city of San Francisco said, hey, that was one of our historic buildings and we want to preserve that and you could not um, uh, bulldoze that property even though you own it. So what you have to do, and the court ruled that what he had to do was build an exact replica from the plans of that 900 square foot home. The guy says, hey, look, I've got a family of six. Uh, my whole idea was to turn this into a 3,000 square foot home so I could live here. And now they're making him say, not only does he have to rebuild this at great expense, it's got to be a, an exact replica, a 900 square foot home. Well, does he own that, so that property so, or doesn't so, he? So a tiny home is okay if it's, if it's, if it's 150 years old. Uh, there, uh, you know, but it goes to show that there's no such thing as property rights. So yeah, you, sure. you can do what, you know, what, what the city, the county, or the neighborhood says you can do. Well, one of the other interesting things about the homeless problem, too, and HUD puts out a report every year on this, and um, I, I believe this is from the 2017 report, but you can see it's, it's actually starting to decrease in some places in the country, but they're mostly red states. It's a lot of the blue states where it's still on the increase. And what's even more interesting is it's on the increase in Hawaii, which, you know, it's, it, you can't imagine that homeless are swimming over there. <laughs> so, yeah. so, I mean, it makes you really wonder what's, what's going on. What's the, our, our policies causing this? It's, it's Hawaii has been in trouble for a long time. It's a bottom five state economically. You would think it's paradise, you know, but look at California. California is the bottom. 
And so you talk about two places that are paradise in terms of you know the geography itself, but uh, the policies have been uh, so bad for so long, so blue, that uh, nobody can live there. It reminds me of, the, of an old O. Henry short story about the guy who uh, decides to break windows every uh, October so he can get a nice warm place to sleep in the jail right. for the wind months. <laughs> Um, the, uh, one of the contributing uh, factors to homelessness, to poverty, to uh, just economic malaise, all, all, you know, wherever you look, is the perception that Americans, American workers, are being competed with unfairly by workers in other countries, hence the Trump trade wars, who are supported philosophically by the left as well as the right, even though, they'll, even though the, the, the left is backing off a little bit now because it's Trump's baby. Trade wars, where are they going? Where will, where, uh, how, bad will, how bad will protectionism have to get before people figure out this is not working for us? Well, uh, the context of it, and here, here, here's a great example. Uh, China just announced uh, last week that it was reducing the tariffs on American cars into China from 40% down to 15 percent. So what has happened really coming out of World War II was that we allowed uh, countries that had just been devastated, Europe and China and Japan, I mean the entire world, uh, Eastern, you know, uh, other than North and South America, had just been obliterated. And we were the only manufacturing engine left. So it was, seemed fair to allow them in the name of peace to say, okay, you can, uh, you can make our goods uncompetitive in your world because you want to build your own industry. You need to rebuild your own industry. We're, we didn't suffer any damage in World War II, so you know we're, we'll pay that price. But as the years went on, and especially during the 70s when Japan had rebuilt itself miraculously, uh, and then you go into the 90s where Germany had rebuilt itself miraculously, uh, technologically, China stole all our secrets, did the same, that we could no longer compete um, on being just <coughs> exceptional. So what has really happened is there have been tariffs against our goods in Japan, in our trading partners, our best trading partners, that have been much higher than any tariff we've ever imposed. What is happening, it seems, is that the direction will be that tariffs go down, not up. Uh, and I think that China's, uh, China's uh, dropping from 40% to 15%, while they're still in this negotiation about tariffs being 10% across equal dollars of goods, going to maybe 25% and they call the truce to that while they negotiate, my sense is that what's going to happen is that tariffs are coming down against the U.S. and that the U.S. will say, okay, fair enough. Uh, so actually, I'm fairly positive on that front as as a um, ec ec economics person, but as also as an investor. Any time that you have an opportunity like that, uh, where there is near-term dislocation, that you know the problem will get solved, because we have the much stronger hand. China just simply can't stand with us. Europe cannot stand with us. They've got France. They've got Italy. They've got the hard Brexit. Uh, they are falling fast. And so we have all the leverage in the world for all the trading partners who have higher tariffs against us than we have ever imposed on them. So I think there's some. So you think there. the Trump Teddy Roosevelt big stick is uh, actually going to work? That the yeah. uh, the uh, yeah. uh, tough guy stance is going to lower tariffs yeah. of American exports? Yeah. And in, in the end, I mean, it, just to, you know, just in case it hasn't already been driven home, but I mean, uh, free trade is good. You know, trade wars tariffs are terrible. And I mean, Ronald Reagan said it best when he said, look, we're in the same boat with our trading partners. And if one of them says, you know, gets tough and, and shoots a hole in the boat, you know, it doesn't do any good to, to say, hey, I'm going to get tough and shoot another hole in the boat. <laughs> you know, I'll show you. And, and uh, um, you know, that, that doesn't help anybody out. So, I mean, you're, you're still better off as long as the, the trade is voluntary and it happens. You're, you're still better off that, it, that it's happening. But, 
um, you know, Trump's getting tough thing. You know, the only way this turns out good is if, like you're saying, that it, it results in everybody dropping their trade barriers. But if it if it doesn't, then well, I mean, in, in Trump's to Trump's credit, he has said on on a couple of different occasions, hey, my 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 ultimate goal is no no tariffs. And if that, in fact, is what he's trying to do with his uh, bully boy uh, tactics, hey, more power to him. Although I think there would probably be easier and better ways of going about it. He's also made statements like, we, we've got to produce steel, we've got to produce this, yeah, that, and the is, other thing. Which is totally contradictory. Exactly. I mean, you know, whatever happened to the, uh, you know, the Adam Smith, uh, uh, you know, uh, ideas. Well, but the, the deal with that is that even, uh, you know, Trump very seriously proposed at the G7 uh, last summer to have a no tariff zone among the G7, which are the largest economies in the world. And they, uh, they laughed him right out of the conference. Uh, he uh, proposed bilaterally with Germany to say, let's not have tariffs on US autos going to Germany or German autos coming to the US. Let's just eliminate it. Merkel said, I don't think so. Uh, so the bottom line on this really is that the tariffs are hugely to the advantage or protectionist for our trading partners. And uh, we have always been the good old US and said, hey, we, you know, we're so blessed uh, in ways that they are not, that it almost seemed okay given uh, the conflicts around the world well, and the fall I mean, of communism, I mean, et cetera. You know, if you look at uh, it, tariffs do nothing for the consumers in the countries. Absolutely not, no. All that is, all is, it's a tax on consumption on the, on the, on the, uh, the uh, citizens of the country that's laying the tariff. That's all it is. Absolutely. They're not paid by, you know, we, U.S. companies don't pay the tariffs. The company or the uh, people that we export to, those are the people There that is an interesting tariffs. concept with that in terms of pricing power. And what we have found over the last 50 years now is that companies have no pricing power. Uh, the world is by nature deflationary. Uh, which is, a lot which of that is a has good to do thing. with technology. It should be, and, and and so the argument that um, corporations never pay a tax; they just pass it on, is to some degree too true. Well, it's totally true. But there is no buying power at the consumer level, and there hasn't been. And so, uh, you know, one of the things that's so interesting about everything going on with the Fed now, and we'll talk about that at some point, but um, is that Fed is supposedly fighting inflation, and there hasn't been a lick of inflation. Uh, you know, the last 10 years, the inflation rate has been exactly the same, 1.8%, and it's going to be that way this year. And in the face of that, the Fed raised interest rates 15 times. <laughs> What's it fighting? Uh, Trump, is, Trump has, has, has made his name on essentially two issues. One was trade, the other is immigration. Mm -hmm. And immigration has been, in my opinion, an unadulterated boon for the economy from the beginning of our history right up until the present time. Very, very few negatives. Now we're looking at some of the downfalls of uh, having a tough, quote unquote, immigration policy, including a child dying in custody. Uh, thoughts on that, uh, Jason? Well, um, you know, just to, to start off the, uh, the issue, I guess, you know, for, for generally for libertarians, I mean, we would certainly favor you know, free tra or, or free movement of labor, free movement of people across borders. Um, it, it gets a little bit complicated when you start having a, a social welfare state because then you're not sure exactly why people are coming. You know, if it's because they're, they they want to work and, and have a job, or if there's some other motive. Um, and so that's kind of what's muddling the current state is that we don't seem to, you know, have a good grasp on exactly what are the costs and benefits of the immigration at the moment. But this particular story was a, uh, a girl who was caught with her uh, father with a, a group of, of, of illegal migrants in Texas. And um, shortly after being caught, she died of dehydration within eight hours of being uh, in the custody of the um, Customs and Border Patrol. And uh, so one of the, I guess, the, the key issues here is that obviously this is something that's being made hay of by the left because they're very concerned uh, uh, about Trump's border tactics um, at the moment. But, you know, it, it, the, the most terrible thing of all this is we have this terrible immigration policy where we are essentially winking and nudging at people, telling them that there's the potentially work here, there's potentially some benefits here, and then we're not allowing them to come in in an open and transparent way. And so, you know, this little girl was from Guatemala. That's about a 1,600-mile hike, you know, coming from, from all the way from there to Texas. And, you know, it's, uh, 
you know, certainly it's, it's hard to imagine that she died because of the, the Border Patrol's practices necessarily, you know, 1,600 miles and dying of dehydration within eight hours of being um, picked up by the Border Patrol, but it it's just goes to the, the terrible tragedy that's our current system that we, we just can't seem to get around. I mean, we've been struggling with this for 20 or 30 years, and it just seems to me if we had a system where we, you know, try and understand whatever the uh, some of the conservative arguments are for for being concerned that people are going to abuse the social safety net, and if if we can understand you know some of the more liberal arguments of letting people come into work because you know uh, people should be allowed to to have consensual relationships with each other. I, I don't see why it matters where you're born. Then if if we could just sit down and work out some of these numbers and and say okay maybe maybe just have a, a a different standard of social benefits or something that everybody agrees upon and then just let these people come let them work let them come transparently and I mean I it just you know this little girl is just one person who's died and I mean everybody's focused on that because it's a seven-year-old girl but there's so many people who have made this journey and have died have people been you know raped murdered whatever coming across this and and a lot of them are just hardworking people who want to work for somebody, and it's a, just a terrible tragedy. Well, I think you just said a mouthful, Jason, about uh, this wink and a nod policy, not only on immigration, but it's often, it, it has to do with, you know, driving a car is a wink and a nod. It's illegal, but we'll wink and nod, let you do it until we don't. Uh, but with immigration, there has never been any impetus from the left to make it legal or solve the problem at all. The impetus has been, you will remain illegal and we will arrest you at any time, so you better toe the line and do what we want, particularly in California where it was so important to our agricultural economy, as well as our service economy in all of these urban cities. Uh, so, and when, you get, and, when you get, and when you become a citizen, vote Democratic. Um, I, I, it's not clear that they ever want them to become, the path to citizenship well, is they, impossible. Well, yeah. Um, I have had, I have been fortunate to have to represent a number of um, uh, East Indian, actual Indian clients who were able to get their green cards because they were productive workers, they got in on the visa program, the HB1, uh, and so we had this immigration system that says, yeah, we think we kind of like to pick you up, you're a good get, like a sports team or something. Uh, but when you talk about the libertarian viewpoint of let everybody come, the economics of it, nobody argues with that anymore. The economics are good. Uh, the more you let in, our resources are virtually infinite relative to other countries. Uh, you know, we, we have a population of 327 million people, and China is 1.2, India 1.4 billion. You know, our resources are infinite. And so the economics are in favor, our resources are Well, the economics are in favor for one simple reason. Everybody who comes here and works and, and is productive is also a consumer. Exactly. So it's a win-win. It's a win-win exactly. all the way around. There is no loss. Now, uh, uh, empirically, the social uh, benefit problem is a, is a non-starter. Most immigrants, I mean, the, 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 the number of immigrants who come here to uh, take advantage of social services is minuscule compared to the number who come here to work. Uh, there are obviously exceptions to that, but it's generally not a problem. Uh, and it's because the people who are willing to walk from Guatemala to Tijuana are not the people who are the, the sluggards, the, the layabouts. They're, are, they're people who want to make their lives better uh, by working. They're not coming here for welfare. They're and coming I, here to do a job and to make more money and to better their lives. I would remind people of uh, Hillary Clinton when she was Secretary of State. Uh, and we had another one of these, you know, marches from Central America, and she said, turn them around. And they did turn them around, and they died. And there were women and children. And there was a great shot at the time that Perry was going to be running for president, a great shot of he and Obama in the helicopter saying, and, and Obama said, hey, Perry and I are not very different on immigration. We're, we're here in the music. Coming up here, I guess it's time to wrap her up. So thank you very much for being part of the Libertarian Counterpoint. We'll see you again next week, same time, same place. Channel 27 and 7 www.accessofficer.org and on YouTube. Thank you.